Welcome to the Online Bodyguard Podcast with host Philip Rendell, CEO and founder of Diffuse, a global threat and intelligence consultancy that blends psychology and intelligence to mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. Diffuse is a boutique protective intelligence consultancy that combines psychology and intelligence to identify, assess, and mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. Our podcast, The Online Bodyguard, discusses the issues facing prominent people and brands with the world's most up-to-date and recognised experts. It discusses how we assess threats, the use of psychology and profiling, targeted violence, the threats from fixated people, crisis and reputation management, cyberbullying, harassment, stalking and so much more. Our objective at Diffuse is to bring together the expertise available to assist our clients to feel safer in public life. This episode is very special. This episode is with what I've called the godfather of threat assessment, Dr. Reid Malloy. Dr. Malloy has been at the forefront of the science behind assessing threats, and especially those directed at public figures, for over 30 years. It's an absolute privilege for me to introduce Dr. Reid Malloy. I'm going to read his bio out. It's quite long, but it reinforces the expertise that Dr. Malloy has. Dr. Malloy is a board certified forensic psychologist and consults on criminal and civil cases throughout the US and Europe. He is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine and a faculty member of the San Diego Psychoanalytic Center. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and a past president of the American Academy of Forensic Psychology. He has received a number of awards and honors, including the first National Achievement Award in 1998 from the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals and the Manfred Guttmacher Award from the American Psychiatric Association in 2021. Dr. Malloy has authored or co-authored over 250 papers published in peer-reviewed psychiatric and psychological journals and has authored, co-authored or or edited 13 books. He has been consulting, researching and writing about personality disorder, psychopathy, stalking, narcissism, criminality, mental disorder, and targeted violence for the past 30 years. His first book, The Psychopathic Mind, was an integration of the biological and psychodynamic understanding of psychopathy. His co-edited book with Dr. Hoffman and Diffuse's own Dr. Lorraine Sheridan, Stalking, Threatening and Attacking Public Figures, led to a commissioned study the National Academy of Sciences on Threats Towards Public Figures, published in 2011. The first edition of the International Handbook of Threat Assessment was published in 2014, and the second edition last year in 2021. Stephen White and Dr. Reed Malloy created the WAV21 version 3, a structured professional judgment instrument for targeted workplace and campus violence. Dr. Malloy has been a consultant on criminal counterintelligence and counterterrorism cases for their Behavioural and Analytic Unit at FBI Quantico for the past 20 years. His counterterrorism work began when he was retained as the consulting forensic psychologist by the US Attorney General in the prosecution of the defendant McFay and Nichols in the Oklahoma City bombing cases. He is the originator and developer of the TRAP-18, the Terrorist Radicalization Assessment Protocol, a validated risk assessment instrument used by counterterrorism professionals in North America and Europe. He was a member of the Fixated Research Group for the UK's Home Office concerning threats to the royal family and British political figures, and is a consulting member of Work Trauma Services, headquartered in San Francisco, and Team Psychology and Security in Darmstadt, Germany. He was a founding associate editor of the Journal of Threat Assessment and Management. 
Dr. Malloy is intermittently quoted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and many others. He was a technical consultant to the television series CSI, from its inception in 2000 until its final episode five years later in 2015, and is the technical consultant to Indivisible Healing and Hate, a Paramount Plus television series exploring the historical roots of the January 6, 2021 insurrection. So here we are, Dr. Malloy, welcome to the Online Bodyguard. Um, it's an absolute honour, as I said, to have you here because I, I've been studying your work for the last few years and certainly all the time I've been in this world. So, so thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you, Phil. Glad to be here. My first question really is, you know, you've been at the forefront of assessing threats, you know, especially with regards to those directed at public figures and prominent members of society for over 30 years. What's changed in that time? Uh, that's a that's an excellent question, Phil. And uh, Molly Ammon, who is a very close friend of mine and a colleague, and I uh, uh, wrestled with that question and decided to do a study. And so we looked at um, uh, public figure attackers, uh, and this was actually just limited to the United States. But we looked at public figure attackers from um, the uh, mid 1990s until 20, uh, 2016. So, or tw actually 2015. So we had about a, about a um, 20 year history because we wanted to compare our findings there with what Robert Fine and Brian Vosgiel had found in their secret service study, which essentially looked at attackers in the second half of the 20th century, public figure attackers in the U S and we, and we did find some striking dis uh, differences. Uh, some of the things that stayed the same is that a number of the attackers, in fact, a majority would typically have psychiatric problems. Uh, in other words, major mental disorders, not just um, uh, more benign issues such as anxiety or depression, but these were like major diagnosable conditions. We found that also majority typically had some kind of, uh, some kind of criminal background. Uh, criminality that was a part of their history. Uh, they were typically uh, all males. Uh, it's very unusual for a female, although it does happen, to attack a public figure. Um, but we also <clears throat> we also found some things that had changed. One of the most interesting things is that we used to see a lot of cases of public figure attackers uh, where the motivation was uh, was fame. Uh, I gave you a couple of examples. Uh, Sirhan Sirhan, um, there was a there was an ideological terrorist motivation there in Sirhan Sirhan, but there is also a desire to be known. We saw that with Mark David Chapman in his attack on John Lennon, where he really was uh, seeking fame by killing John Lennon. Uh, one of the other notable cases uh, that where this was uh, quite apparent was the Andrew Cunanan killing of Gianni Versace in Florida in the mid 1990s. But what we saw then change was this narcissism of seeking fame began to shift to a narcissism of entitlement that I have been personally aggrieved by this public figure, and I now have a right to attack them because of what they've done to me. And so you see the narcissism shift from a desire for fame to an angry entitlement that I am going to attack this person for reasons of oftentimes of a grievance that affects my relationships or affects my work or somehow affects my personal life. Uh, along with that, one of the most interesting things was that one third of the public figure attackers in the United States during this most recent 20 year period uh, were actually known by the public figure. So this wasn't a stranger that came out of the blue in a third of the cases. It was somebody, somebody that the public figure uh, had known. So this, so this personal angry grievance aspect to the case has really be, become much more intensified over the past 20 years 
than it was in the first half of the 20th or second half of the 20th century. So I think one thing always fascinates me is, is the link between the attackers having a mental health condition and yet their ability to behave very rationally when planning their and planning and carrying out their attack. And that confuses people in terms of they, they have this perception that if you've got those sort of significant mental health issues, that you must be mad. And therefore, how can you how can you do that? How can you be so rational in your planning? Oh, absolutely. I want to preface what I'm about to say with the comment that that most people that have a severe mental disorder are not dangerous toward other people. Absolutely. They're not going to be violent toward others. They're not going to commit a homicide. In fact, the severely mentally ill are much more likely to be victimized themselves or to commit suicide. Uh, that being said, uh, we do see a prominent mental disorder in attackers of uh, public figures. And the old traditional belief is one that you just articulated, that how can somebody with a mental disorder uh, be organized in uh, mounting an attack and that has been, in a sense, a counterintuitive finding that within a major mental disorder, such as a psychosis or specifically a delusion where you have a fixed and false belief, there can be a rationality within the irrationality. So within the delusion, we have learned that individuals can um, uh, plan, uh, research, prepare, and implement uh, an attack uh, despite their mental disorder. But here's something that I that I picked up a number of years ago, and I've 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 written about it a little bit, but uh, without any formal year research. It's just my my consulting experiences. Is that sometimes having a delusion brings a resolve and a commitment to attack the public figure that would not be there without the delusion. In other words, the delusion eliminates any feelings of ambivalence. And that's a quite striking finding, I think, that also has appeared in, in some cases. And so when they have that fixation and, and they're on that path and they potentially are stalking, do they, I mean, do they just stop of their own volition? Is there, is there times when they just think, actually, I've changed my mind and I, I've decided I'm, I'm not going to do this. I've seen, seen the light or I've just decided to stop. Yeah, we do see that. We see uh, uh, attackers of public figures oftentimes will have will have fixated on other targets before they settle on the one target they're going to attack. A lot of times that decision is actually very rational because they they're measuring the security uh, of the individual. And we've seen that with some of the public figure attacks um, in uh, the U.S. Um, among uh, in Mali, in my research, among the um, the uh, I think we had 58 incidents, if I'm not mistaken, over that 20 year period. So there's about there's about um, um, about th slightly less than three public figures a year that are attacked in the United States. Um, but among those individuals, you will see them. Um, uh, you know, thinking about other individuals to attack and then settling on a particular person. But in some cases, of course, just backing off and not doing that. With the Sirhan Sirhan case, the individual that killed uh, Robert Kennedy, there's actually evidence that he had, um, and it, was, it literally came from videotapes and still photos uh, after the assassination, that he had actually approached Robert Kennedy on four different occasions, physically approached him and got actually quite close to him in a crowd uh, before he carried out the assassination. Uh, on June 6th of 1968. Uh, now, we don't know if those approaches, he was testing security or those were uh, those were thwarted attacks. Uh, we just don't know. But we do know that there was proximity seeking. So you will get that proximity seeking. And of course, there may be numbers of cases we don't even know about where people have planned an attack and then it backed off at the last minute. But that being said, it's also important to recognize that most people that problematically approach a public figure are not doing so uh, to injure or kill that public figure. They're actually 
wanting to do any number of things. It could be to form a relationship with them, to form a romantic relationship with them, uh, to be sexual with them, uh, to have them solve a problem in the personal life of the individual, to be help seeking. So there's typically lots of motivations of approachers, but among all the approachers, problematic approachers that we see of of public figures, there may be a few that then set out to actually uh, injure or want to kill the public figure. I think that's a really interesting point. I, and I know that, you know, you and I both obviously know Lorraine, who, who's part of Diffuse, uh, Lorraine Sheridan. And, and we, you know, that's one of the reasons that we we do use the kind of profiling that Lorraine does to to really understand the motivation. Because, you know, we've had an example very recently where, um the particular stalker actually thought that the person they were stalking was in danger and they were trying to help that individual. And actually yes. what was happening was that the threat became directed at the security and the management because they were thwarting that approach behavior. So she never yes. intended harm to the, to the, to the, the actual uh, end, end product, if you like, but she became aggravated and escalated because she felt she was being thwarted. Yeah, that's a that's a great example. I actually I actually did some writing on cases like that a number a number of years ago where and I call it triangulation. And a lot of times that will come out of um, the the stalker believing that they have a romantic relationship with the public figure and uh, the public figure reciprocates and the public figure does love the individual and psychiatrically that is called uh, erotomania or erotomanic delusional disorder and within that um, uh, very delusional you know psychotic within that ex psychotic experience uh, develops the belief that third parties are keeping me from that person and um, uh, then the antipathy becomes directed toward the third party uh, and oftentimes that third party are, are the security people. And there may not have been an actual, um, uh, 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 you know, stoppage or thwarting of the of the approach in that person's own mind. They believe that these third parties, these security people are keeping them uh, from the person. Um, I did. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was uh, was uh, stalked a number of years ago by a, a fellow named uh, Dante Soyu. And this is this is public information. And I. Uh, had the opportunity to, to evaluate uh, Mr. Soyu uh, both prior to um, his um, uh, hospitalization for being actually he was found to be not guilty by reason of insanity because he did have this erotomanic delusional disorder toward Gwyneth Paltrow. And then I also was able to evaluate him eight years later after eight years of hospitalization and treatment when the court was considering him returning to the community, which he subsequently subsequently did. Um, but within that particular case, this was um, illustrative that he actually believed that there were certain figures, mainly security people and also other male actors that Gwyneth Paltrow had dated that were keeping him and her from being together. And he also implicated Gwyneth Paltrow's mother that she was uh, did not want him to have any contact with her. But see, he never thought uh, or would consider uh, the, uh, the, the actuality that uh, Ms. Paltrow was actually very scared of him, knew about the case and was very frightened he was going to, uh, he was going to do something. So that um, the actual rejection and dislike by Miss Paltrow toward him was not something that he would consider within his delusion. Which brings me on to another point then. So, you know, many prominent people that we work with, and, I, and I'm, I'm, you know, you've, you've been doing this for a good deal longer, you know, whether they're celebrities, politicians, business leaders, et cetera, you know, they often have somebody who's managing their social media or managing their communication. So very often the, the target, if you like, is unaware that something is going on. How does the – what what should those security or the, the, the secretary or the whoever's managed the gatekeeper, what should they be looking out for? What are those sort of red flags that they should be looking for? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important question because uh, t typically uh, security folks want to shield the public figure, the protectee, from a lot of this data that's coming at them. And, and you know, we're, we're living in a tsunami 
of threats coming through social media, things like that, problematic approachers, things of that nature. And so you want to shield or protect you from that. But the decision point becomes um, when should you inform the protectee? And I think the, the point of informing is where there's a judgment that this is a higher imminent risk case. And you want the protectee to be able to visually recognize this person uh, if they should find themselves in a situation where they're being approached. Um, so uh, that would be the, the, uh, the decision point that needs to be made. But then how that decision should be made and when, of course, is another issue. Uh, one of the one of the key things that we look at in our um, in our warning behavior typology, our proximal warning behaviors, are uh, is what's what we call last resort behavior, uh, and this is where uh, the person begins to communicate uh, to others, "I must act, and I must act now." Now, this could be in the context of violence. You know, I must act violently and I must act now. Uh, and my good friend, Chris Mohandi, years ago labeled this um, a uh, violent time and action imperative. Um, it could be, it could mean violence. But on the other hand, it could be just a uh, absolute commitment and determination to make this f- uh, physical approach to the person. You know, I must be with this person and I must be with them now. So I would want last resort behavior to be an important part of that decision making. Uh, And then, of course, we're going to weigh uh, capability of the individual. We're going to weigh what is the opportunity for them to approach. And then um, and then has there been any change in uh, motivation? So we're looking at motivation, capability, opportunity, and then weighing those very carefully in um, in deciding. And uh, as you know, uh, Phil, the. Uh, the Secret Service uses that model all the time, and whenever the protectee, the main protectee, the President of the United States, would like visit a city, the Secret Service will actually have contact with any problematic approachers in the community, uh, any uh, people that may potentially pose a pose a threat to the president, and then we'll actually monitor those folks um, while the president is in town, uh, and that monitoring may mean. Uh, believe it or not, uh, having lunch with the guy uh, and meeting with him and finding out what he's thinking and what he's doing and what he's up to and whether he has any, has any plans. So a lot of time there's a, there's a social work component to threat assessment that's very important. Um, uh, Secret Service does it. Other people should be doing it. Uh, it's a very important part of, of monitoring and managing the, uh, the threatening landscape toward public figures. So when I've looked at, um, you know, your research and others, one of, one of the, the things that jumped out at me was this concept around those that communicate threats don't necessarily pose that threat, the kind of hunter and howler concept, which I, which I love. But the bit that confused me a little bit was then one of the warning behaviours is making direct threats. So how, how do you kind of explain that, that yeah. dichotomy there? Yeah, good question. The uh, uh, one of the early findings in the research was that um, was this notion of hunter howler was people that hunt uh, don't howl. In other words, don't, uh, you know, loudly express their threats. And then people that howl don't hunt. Well, it's a it's a it's a it was a good and overly simplified categorization that I think. Uh, was a sea change in terms of threat assessment uh, to acknowledge that most attackers of public figures do not directly threaten beforehand. Um, and that that shouldn't necessarily, just the direct threatener should not be the only focus uh, in uh, protecting of public figures. But that kind of simple binary notion of hunters and howlers howlers can be a bit misleading too, because there are hunters that howl and there are howlers that hunt. And uh, even though the percentage of individuals that attack a public figure that have directly threatened uh, is actually quite small, probably no more than 5%, um, there's still 5%. And so you have to take every direct threat seriously, even though you know 
that um, uh, attackers that actually uh, try to consummate what they're doing are typically not going to have threatened directly beforehand. What they do instead, so that so it's in the mix, you know, it's in the typology because we want all threats to be taken seriously and you do have a small portion, but consistently we found in our research that the um, the direct threats are very a very low frequency toward public figures, as well as in all targeted attackers, whether it's a public figure or not. If it's a targeted attack, typically you don't have a direct threat uh, in most cases. But what they do, and one of the things I want to say to your audience is uh, what targeted attackers do is they engage in leakage. And leakage is communication uh, to a third party of an of an intent to attack a target. So it's very different from a direct threat, communication to a third party. That could be social media, could be posting somebody, it could be a it could be a tweet, uh, you know, it could be a direct message to a friend, whatever it might be. But um, uh, leakage is very common in 60 to 90 percent of targeted attackers, including public figures, there will be leakage of intent to a third party, 60 to 90 percent. And so leakage oftentimes is the first proximal warning behavior that people like you and I will become aware of in a case and it opens the investigation. And then, of course, we're looking at other proximal warning behaviors uh, within the case to see if this person is actually on a pathway to violence or not. Now, there's another paradox in here, too, and that is that most people that leak, you know, that engage in leakage, communication of intent to a third party, eventually do not do not go on to attack. So you have this other paradox, which is that most leakage is what we call uh, false positive data. In other words, we think that they may attack, but in fact, if we just let them go forward, they, they wouldn't do that. So it's, it's more complicated than it looks, but that leakage is very important for opening the door on the early investigation in the case. But I'm very conscious that your work is around, you know, you're very clear it is. It's not predicting who's going to attack. It's preventing those that, that do in terms of identifying or narrowing the focus, if you like, around, you know, you've got lots and lots of people making threats or making, you know, being abusive, et cetera. And the, the proximal behavior indicators are there to narrow that focus to Correct. identify the people of concern. But it's not about Correct. kind of, you know, mass prediction of these 20 people are, are going to attack, these ones aren't. Yeah, you know, in many ways, it's like uh, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of analogies here, but it's a, you know, essentially it's a it's a public health model. Um, it's an epidemiological model where you're looking at uh, primary prevention and secondary prevention. You know, the uh, and I'll, I'll use the Secret Service as an example. Uh, you know, the primary prevention idea is that you have um, a uh preventive bubble around the president of the United States that travels with him wherever he goes, whether he's in the White House or whether he's on the road, that there's a bubble around President Biden. And that's uh, essentially, uh, you know, primary one aspect of primary prevention. The secondary prevention is where you ident you're identifying people of concern uh, that come to your attention and then you investigate them and, you know, to to assess whether they actually pose a a viable threat uh, toward the prevention or toward, uh, you know, viable threat of an attack toward the president. So um, uh, this, uh, a lot of good threat assessment work draws from that public health model is you take prevention steps in the broad society uh, to do protective uh, things. And then secondly, you zero in on cases where the a person of concern emerges and then identify that risk, assess that risk, and then manage that risk. So can we just talk a little bit about those behaviours of concern? Because they, they'll be unknown to a lot of people. And, and you know, I'm, I'm obviously aware of them. I've studied your work. And, I, you know, as, as I've discussed with you, I've used it to help stop attacks in, yeah. in the UK in Parliament. So I know that it works. Can you just talk a little bit about what, you know, the primary kind of behaviours that, that if people are not... They're not psychologists. They're not um, in that world. They might be just a security person, or not, I say not just a security person. They might be a security person, or they might be a management of a, of a celebrity. You know, 
what are the ones that they think actually that's that's a bit odd i need to know about that yeah among the among the proximal warning behaviors we've actually done a lot of research on this now uh, over the past over the past decade among our proximal warning behaviors uh, uh, the ones that we're most concerned about uh, are three uh, because and i'm going to say these three because these have differentiated attackers from non-attackers um uh, non-attackers be, be, be are people the way i'm defining it are people of concern but uh, end result is that they don't go on to attack so that's what i mean when i say non-attackers but these three the first one is pathway pathway is a very old one of the first uh, behaviors identified uh, by uh, Robert Fine and Brian Voskul in the Secret Service in terms of uh, how individuals will get on a pathway toward violence. And what we look for in pathway as a proximal behavior, proximal warning behavior, is any uh, research, planning, preparation, or implementation of an attack. So you're looking at very specific behaviors the person is engaging in, uh, such as, um, you know, weapons access, you know, uh, practicing building a bomb, looking at, I, I did a case last year where there was, uh, the individual was looking very closely at, at Google Maps for approaching uh, public corporate figures on the website. And they also modified a, um, uh, a uh, semi-automatic weapon uh, against the laws of California. He, he, he modified it so it would fire automatically. Um, and, and these are just very specific tactical behaviors that would uh, strongly suggest that the person's on a on a pathway to violence. So we're looking at that stuff very carefully. And that, again, we refer to uh, as late stage markers on the on the pathway to violence. So anything uh, tactically related, uh, anything where there's specificity, specificity about a target, any reconnaissance that the person is doing to uh, uh you know, exploit the uh, the habitual behaviors of the target and know what they are would be very important. The second one is what we call um, uh, we call identification, and identification does also separate attackers from non-attackers. And this is where you move from being preoccupied or fixated on a target to um, uh, becoming a soldier or an agent to attack that target. Now, in the broader context, context, for instance, of terrorism, the fixation may be on a person or a cause. Um, we've um, we saw this in uh, uh, magnified, of course, uh, in, very intensely on January sixth in the United States with our with the uh, with the attack on our capital. Um, and uh, I can use that here as an example. The fixation or the preoccupation would be uh, the the false belief, the extreme overvalued belief, as uh, Dr. Tahir Rahman and I would put it, uh, that uh, the Trump won the election. The election was a fraud. You know, that's the fixation. It's simple. It's binary. It's absolute. The election was a fraud. Trump won it. Uh, millions of people had that fixation. Okay, but the movement to identification is the shift in thinking from, I know that this is true, that Trump won the election, to I'm now a soldier for the group that is going to overthrow the certification of the vote. I'm now a soldier for my cause, or I'm an agent for my cause. So it goes from fixation to self-identity. And there's literally a, a movement from feeling of being victimized to now being a soldier for the cause that I'm advocating for. So we look for identification uh, as a very important marker that may indicate mobilization for violence by the individual. And the other way we look at identification oftentimes is because people, most people have very poor operational security. So they will display a self identity you know, they'll, they'll display these identifications. Uh, uh, Sam Gosling in Texas, Professor Gosling calls it uh, identity claims. You know, they'll put out these identifications, they'll have the flag, they'll be wearing the uniform, they'll be wearing the patches. 
uh, they'll be wearing uh, uh, a helmet that says Antifa Hunter on it. Uh, you know, they do things that communicate what their identity is now becoming. So that's the second one, identification. And then the third one that, that uh, oftentimes uh, strongly suggests imminent risk is the last resort behavior I'd already talked to you about. I must act and I must act now. And we have seen that time and again in both ideological terrorism as well as non-ideological mass attackers is they come to this position that they must act and they must act now. Now, to elaborate on that just a little bit, because um, I know I'm talking a lot, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the mandate to act may, be just, um, may just be psychological pressure that you've, that you've developed within yourself. And there may not be any external reason to act, or it actually could be an anticipated event that's coming. Uh, the example I would give you, again, boy, going back to January 6th, there was a, a certification of the vote on January 6th. So that became the anticipated event. I must go to Washington to stop this. And um, this is very much on my mind because we just recently had um, uh, the first individual plead guilty of, of uh, insurrection yesterday here in the United States. Um, and the, the group, the particular group that was uh, planning and preparing for the violence is referred to as the Oath Keepers. And a lot of these guys are now indicted. Um, but another example of this last resort where there's an anticipated event is uh, uh, Malik Hassan, who carried out the mass attack at Fort Hood in Texas in the United States, uh, a massacre now over, over a decade ago. And it, his last resort behavior was prompted by the fact that he was going to be deployed as a psychiatrist, uh, likely to Afghanistan. He, at that point, was a radicalized jihadist, believed the West was at war with Islam. He did not want to go to Afghanistan. All his legal efforts to keep from going to Afghanistan failed. And he carried out his mass attack on the day that his unit was being medically processed to be deployed to Afghanistan. So there we have last resort stimulated by the anticipation of a specific event. So in our work that we do, we're always asking ourselves, is there an anticipated event here that could stimulate last resort behavior? So if we go back then to the pathway, because I, I, I kind of see it this way in terms of the, the correlation there between that that movement from grievance to violent ideation, where that tipping point where I have this grievance, I've, I've looked to try and resolve it in whatever way I, I, I've chosen, I can't resolve it. And therefore, my only option is now to go towards violence. And, and that's that kind of tipping point movement. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And we don't uh, actually, uh, in our late stage markers of the pathway, uh, we have already typically investigated whether there's a personal grievance and then uh, uh, ideation, you know, or, or intent. But you're absolutely right. Those are very important uh, stages on the pathway. Uh, they're much further upstream than tactical planning and preparation, but they're also typically a necessary prelude to planning and preparation. Uh, Typically, we think of personal grievance as having four elements to it, a loss, humiliation, anger, and blame. And if you eliminate any of those four elements, typically you don't have a personal grievance. Um, and of course, all of us have had personal grievances, but typically we don't move to the next step, which is uh, intent to be violent, where there's actually a decision made that I am capable of being violent, uh, that I can accept those consequences, and this is my only alternative in this particular case is to be violent. Um, I'm involved right now in a, a civil suit uh, concerning a, um, uh, a mass uh, attack that happened here in the United States, and um, uh, in the in the it's very clear in the civil suit that this individual had tried. Uh, 
many different legal recourses to solve his problems and and was uh, and the cases were dismissed uh, by by the courts uh, progressively he finally got to the point where he had no other legal recourse and it was at that point he decided yes I'm going to mount this attack and then uh, he essentially shifted his priorities to then spending the next two years uh, very carefully and methodically and in the most meticulous attack I've ever seen of a civilian uh, mass murderer uh, was able to then successfully carry out this attack. But there was a there was an inflection point, a decision point where he decided that that was his only recourse. Do, do you think the the Internet has made it easier or more difficult to identify these people of concern? Yeah, I think it's made it more difficult uh, just because you can do a lot of research now uh, on the Internet in the privacy of your own home. <clears throat> you don't have to be visiting gun stores. You don't have to be uh, uh, trying to purchase ammunition uh, physically, uh, you know, going to a place to do so. So it's it's made it uh, it's made it's made it very hot, hard to ferret out these individuals in the early stages of of their uh, movement on the pathway. Now, as you move on the pathway, excuse me, behaviors tend to be more on the ground by necessity rather than online. So, you, so on the ground behaviors also tend to be more visible to us than than online behaviors, but. That's why I think increasingly we are going to see uh, various kinds of uh, AI, various kinds of artificial intelligence and and, uh, algorithmic uh, processes uh, to sort the data that's being seen uh, on the Internet and in social media to be able to decide which uh, which cases warrant then human investigation. So you have the and this is. Actually, this is already happening. So the algorithms sort all the data and then present to the human investigators uh, the cases that are of greatest concern. And those algorithms are based upon uh, the kinds of research that that we've been talking about. So uh, I think that's clearly the direction that the field is moving in. So so, so you you foresee then that that there'll come a point where there'll be software or or, programs where you you can plug in the the attack behaviors, the, 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 the proximity behaviors, and that will do a lot of the work. But I'm guessing you're still going to need a human to actually yeah. then look at it because a lot of it for me has always been about context. You know, okay, well, they're yeah. doing lots of things, but what's the context behind what they're doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, yeah, an algorithm is an is an opinion expressed in math. And it's never going to account for the idiosyncratic and individualized nature of the cases that we see. So there's always going to be room for human intelligence uh, and human investigators to have to look at the individual case. But I see these, again, working jointly uh, together. Um, There are already programs. Some of these are, of course, proprietary that that have been developed by, for instance, some of the big tech firms that are using algorithms in their security operations to sort, um, uh, 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 you know, um, any kind of signals that come up that may be of concern to them. Uh, there's also some publicly accessible uh, programs. There's a one in Sweden called the Sheffer, uh, D-E-C-H-E-F-R, and they're doing a lot of good work on developing a, um, a threat assessment program that's um, that's an AI program that's based upon the kinds of research that we're doing and other people are doing. Um, but there's always going to be, I think, a, a marriage between the two. And we have to be careful to, uh, in a sense, kind of honor that marriage and not get too enamored by just algorithms. Like, we don't have to do anything now. We can just let the algorithms do the work. On the other hand, we don't want to be so kind of old guard, these old dinosaurs that uh, don't want to acknowledge the importance of uh the development and use of artificial intelligence um, 
but recognize that it has to be joined with human investigation and they both need to be there. So on that note then, when you're, you know, if you are a public figure, a prominent person, a you know, celebrity, VIP, whatever, what should you look for then in a threat assessment company? If you've got an issue, what will, yeah. how, how do you, how do you sort the wheat from the chaff? Yeah, I think it's, uh, again, excellent question. Um, uh, threat assessment is uh, what I call strategic prevention. When um, when the when the first when the first trigger is pulled, threat assessment has failed, and threat management has failed. But to address this stuff upstream, you've got to have a very uh, strong uh, threat assessment, threat management component uh, in your in your company. Uh, a component that's based in the research, that's based in the behavioral science. So what folks need to avoid is the, <clears throat> and oftentimes the pompous guy that comes forward and say, says, well, um, you know, I've been doing this for 35 years. I know what I'm doing. Uh, trust me. And, and here's the contract. Um, you know, you can be playing golf for 30 years and still shoot a hundred. Uh, uh, and that's and personal experience is is not science, and that's really a hard thing for people to understand. That personal experience is not science. So I would want my company to really be uh, up to speed and based in the science, because uh, there's a lot to be known now, and there's a lot that we, that we do know. So that's the first thing, and the second thing is that they be really strong in <clears throat> in tactical reaction. So it's a marriage of of strategic prevention and tactical reaction where they both have great respect for one another. But when the guy's coming through the door or heading for the podium, threat assessment is done. Um, what you're totally dependent on then is body project, body protection and the tactical skill of the officers or the agents that are there to protect the individual. And that's where um, uh, oftentimes uh, personal training and personal experience is is most powerful. Uh, so you want to balance both those. You want to have both of those elements in the company. And also you want those elements to be based not just on experience, but also in the science of the field. And would you say that increasingly what we're seeing is you know, yes, you have the physical threat, and everyone obviously, first and foremost, am I in danger? Is this person going to attack? But the secondary issue nowadays tends to be this reputational threat. Yeah, yeah. Do the same indicators, do, do, do they come into play when people are looking to target reputations? Um, yeah, there are, there are similar indica indicators. There are, also, there are also different ones. With the, uh, with the reputational stuff, oftentimes it's um, – it's harassment of the public figure. And then also uh, sometimes communication through disinformation or misinformation to the public at, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the public as an entity uh, that tends to, you know, tarnish the reputation of the individual. And there have to be also uh, approaches to that. So you have to have people that are managing, uh, and this is not an area of expertise for me, but you need people that need, that know how to manage and, and counter, uh, for instance, social media attacks on the reputation of the individual. But you need a high level of sophistication uh, of social media in these, in these contexts. Uh, one of the, that reminds me of one, of one other thing that I wanted to say was that as we do this kind of work too, we have to recognize that most of our subjects of concern live online and live on the ground simultaneously. Um, I have a 17 year old and uh, uh, she gives me an example of this every day uh, that she lives online and she lives on the ground. And this is what uh, folks much younger than I are doing now. And so we have to ex expect that our persons of concern are also, are also doing that. How that practically translates is that if a case comes to me with with uh, data on what this guy's doing on the ground my next question is well also what's he doing online and then if the case comes to me just with online data my next question is okay what's he doing on the ground 
And you have to be looking at those simultaneously from both an assessment uh, and a management perspective. And that would tie in more to your question of, of you know, reputa- uh, reputational suffering that is also very much a part of threat assessment. So finally, finally, Reid, because I, I know we, we've taken up so much of your time, and I'm, I'm hugely grateful. What would be your, you know, what would be your sort of top tips for people who are, who are in this world or, or are rep- or are looking after public figures in terms of, you know, what, what, you know, here I am, I'm looking after a celebrity or I'm looking after a politician. What are the top tips about what do I need to keep my eyes open for? Oh uh, well, yeah, my top tips are going to be different. Uh, monitor your own narcissism. Okay, interesting. Uh, narcissism is like blood pressure too much or too little is a problem and there's there's healthy narcissism you know and we call it now you know the the pop terms now are resilience grit but it's healthy narcissism it's knowing how to take care of yourself uh, and uh do the good work uh to be able to take care of the people that you love um uh so that would be the first thing that i'd say uh secondly remember that your work is their reputation and what that means, of course, is that if, 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 a, if a group or a person, a public figure, retains you, remember that everything you do is also, for them, a reflection on their own judgment. And so if you, if you bungle the case or you malpractice, that negatively is going to affect how they view themselves and it's also going to very much tarnish your reputation. So remember that, that your work is their reputation. And then um, the last thing uh, I would say here would be to, um, uh, actually two more things. One is follow the rules, but think outside the box. Be very creative. You have to be able to put yourself in the mind of the subject of concern and recognize uh, the creative way they could uh, plan and prepare uh, for an attack. And then the last thing is my one of my favorite all-time saying from um, uh, Korzybski, who is a scientist philosopher, and that is uh, the map is not the territory. In other words, we have lots of maps. We've talked about a lot of them here, the proximal warning behaviors, other, other signals of risk. Um, but each and every case is going to be a slightly different territory. And we have our maps and our maps help, help us navigate on the territory, but the territory will present its own idiosyncrasies and its own anomalies. And each case is different. Brilliant. Reed, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. I could sit here all day and talk to you and you know that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you'd get tired long before I would. But uh, thank you so much. It's been, it's been um you know, informative, educational, and inspiring. So thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you, Phil. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Online Bodyguard podcast with host Philip Grindel, CEO and founder of Diffuse. Please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms.